beautiful, beautiful. Okay, very good, beautiful, beautiful. Here, let me turn you this way. Okay, baby, you are looking so good today. Beautiful, beautiful. Look this way, please. Ah, perfect, beautiful. You are looking just fine. Okay. Look this way. Besides the lounge lizard, there are lizards in incredible variety throughout the world. In bizarre and colorful costumes, these natural actors strut their stuff in deserts and in oceans. In forests, they frighten or seduce with spectacular display. The biggest stalk the earth as though they were resurrected dinosaurs. The smallest are shorter than a child's finger. Our imagination can see them as alien forms, but their origin and success is firmly on planet Earth. And some are simply as cute as we make them. In a time so long ago it's hard to imagine, reptiles explored the world. In an age before the dinosaurs, there were probably lizards among them. No fossil trace of them has been found earlier than 170 million years ago. By that time, a variety of true lizards were sharing the planet with the so-called terrible lizards, the dinosaurs. In this great age of reptiles, Lizards of all shapes and sizes were firmly on the path that would lead to the present day. Because true lizards have claws and scales, and a superficial likeness to some dinosaurs, they have been confused. But lizards are not close relatives of dinosaurs. They are a quite different group of reptiles. The lizard's line of descent from the very first reptiles soon branched off quite separately from those animals which became dinosaurs and crocodiles. Some of the early lizards became ancestors of the snakes. But from then on, lizards remained quite separate from the other groups. All have survived into modern times. And if you like lizards, there are 4,000 different types to choose from. And some can still make you think of dinosaurs. The basilisk, for one, has that prehistoric look. But it's a lizard that's been walking on water as its party trick for more than a million years. Lizards are a varied bunch. They seem to lack a lizard factor something that they all have in common. And yet there's something about a lizard that signals what it is. It's not the scales. Other creatures have those. It's not large size. There are small ones you'd hardly notice. While many hunt by day, others only come out at night. And it's no good counting legs. Most have four, it's true, but there are some which manage on fewer. This is no snake. It's a legless lizard. And there are lizards for all seasons. This one is lapping up ice and snow in Israel an off-piste moment in the spring sunshine. Most lizards bask in the sun, on mountain top or tropical beach. Caribbean iguanas have to sunbathe to get their bodies up to speed. Their cold blood needs to be warmed. These iguanas on a Galapagos island also sunbathe but when the dinner bell rings, they leave the land for a seafood meal. Clumsiness turns to aquatic grace as these massive iguanas head for the seaweeds. The 
water is cold, but they have had to adapt to feeding on algae. There's little vegetation on their island. Sipping nectar in the Seychelles sunlight is far less strenuous. But most lizards aren't vegetarians. Chameleons like their meat. In the deserts of Arizona, the Gila monster also eats meat, and its bite is venomous. And the Komodo dragon of Indonesia, a truly monstrous lizard, has deadly saliva. Lizards can be scary. Come back here. Living with lizards can be the stuff of nightmares. Nice to see you. How are you? But some people love lizards. 37 lizards allow Henry Lizard Lover to share their Los Angeles home. Iguanas want comfort. They want their food. They want to have a safe, certain place to sleep in. They have their little positions they like to get in. Collard greens for you people. Oh, hey, hey. Let's put you right there. OK. I saw everything in an iguana that you would see in a human. Iguanas are Henry's favorite. To him, they're almost human. Perhaps they see him as almost lizard. Hello, kids. I brought you some food. It's lunchtime. Come and get it. It's nice and wet. Come on, I know you guys are going to like it. Hello, my name is Henry. These are my lizards, and I love them more than anything. Many years ago, I changed my name to Henry Lizard Lover because I love these lizards so much. I wrote a book about them, and I do pictures of them that I turn into postcards and greeting cards. Stuff's very healthy for you. Mmm. Lots of minerals, calcium. Just like us, lizards need a healthy diet to look their best. You? But the difference is, they love their greens. Try a piece. Feeding them nature's best veggies and knowing what makes them tick is all part of grooming these stars for Henry's catwalk. My main purpose is to show that iguanas are human-like. They're not some bizarre alien creatures that we have to fear or think of as, as creepy, germy creatures. Every iguana is a, a definite individual. They are all so different from each other, just like people. So Henry Lizard Lover treats his lizards just like people. In California, people like to keep clean, and so do lizards. This is where some of my other lizards stay. These are baby Chinese water dragons from Asia. And they're doing really, really well. They need to stay in a dark place to feel safe. OK. I'll leave you alone. I keep some of my lizards in these drawers. Actually, they go in on their own. They're, they're called Solomon Island tree skinks, and there's a whole family of them in here. This is the mother that's had several of the babies. They're 
there's a this is a whole family. Uh, here's the male that the, the female mates with. And this is a baby from three years ago. About three years old now. And this is a baby they just had about four months ago. Look at this one. Look at this cute little baby. And they go in and out of these drawers on their own. This is one of my favorite ones, this male. I've had him for uh, about 10 years now. That makes him about 12 years old. He's about two years old when I first got him. These are wonderful little creatures. I call this one lovable. Okay. I'll just put them back in their drawers. They come out at night. I didn't really want to disturb them too much in the daytime here. And finally the baby. They'll come out on their own. This is uh, one of my favorite large male iguanas and I have to keep them in this room alone separated from the other males because they fight and they're, they're very vicious towards each other. Okay, I'm going to leave him with the collard greens. And he doesn't get a Henry Lizard lover kiss either. Another of the 10 million people with pet reptiles in the States is Phil Brower. Phil's Washington home is full of heated terrariums. This is my bedroom or my other part of my reptile collection. Hey guys, how you doing? Sleeping still? I'm home. Like it or not. Hey. Oh, to settle down. Where's her girlfriend? Is she still in here? There she is. You guys still getting along? Not beating up on each other? You guys are anxious. There we go. Oh, oh me arm. Oh, those are good. No one could be more passionate about his pets than too. Phil. He's totally addicted to lizards. And to feed and house them, he's just as keen on his day job. He's a zookeeper in a reptile house. Millions are spellbound by lizards. And the key to their charm may be their colour. But the brilliant colours in a lizard's skin are more about sex, threat and disguise than pleasing us. The sort of catwalk they'll be strutting can be dangerously competitive. Chameleons are the most colourful of all lizards. And their colours can be changed quickly. But how is it done? The scales themselves are transparent and dead. Only when colour is pumped into cells beneath them from pigment reservoirs below does a new colour show. When the pigment is drained back into the reservoirs, the skin colour changes back. Colours and patterns change according to what mood the lizard's in. The chameleon is more dramatic as a quick change artist than most lizards. Dark colours and a rocking motion camouflage this Jackson's chameleon. A vivid display of colour signals anger at the intruder. The trespasser lowers his profile and avoids confrontation. It was only looking for food, but the dominant chameleon is guarding his territory and his fancy outfit advertises his aggression. The exact opposite is not being seen. There is a lizard here, but only when it moves can it be seen on the tree. Combat fatigues owe a lot to animal camouflage. Advance 
and don't be recognised is the rule on the bark and under leaves. Earning medals for leaf-like camouflage is this leaf-tailed gecko. A crevice in the rocks is as good a hiding place as a tree hole. This outcrop is home to a colony of South African armadillo girdled lizards. They come out to bask in the sun and to feed, but are ready to dive for cover even when their pursuer has their future welfare at heart. Louise Visagy of Stellenbosch University knows how these lizards, if caught in the open, earn the armadillo bit in their name. I work with great lizards. They live in crevices, which is really great because a predator can't lift those rocks. But what really makes this lizard special is the unique defensive behaviour that gave it its name. And that is why it's called the armadillo lizard. Imagine biting onto this. As you can see, all the hard spines are pointing outwards and the limbs are covering the soft belly. So, it simply lies there and waits for the predator to get bored. Then, it uncurls and runs back into the safety of the crevice. That's the armadillo lizard. The trick depends on a vice-like grip of the mouth onto the tail. Back to its crevice. But it will soon have to brave danger, basking out in the sun again. Which is what all lizards have to do. Even the largest, the Komodo dragon. Being cold-blooded really means not having a constant body temperature like we have. Reptiles must warm up in the sun. Sunlight gives them the energy to become active. The first rays have hardly warmed the granite before a chameleon stretches its body out to catch the sun. Like a solar panel, the chameleon presents as much surface as possible to the sun and absorbs heat. On top of the chameleon's head, just under the skin, is a light sensitive organ, a third eye. It's called the pineal eye and helps pass information to the brain about the intensity and duration of sunlight. Vital information that affects the timing of hibernation and mating. The two sides of a chameleon may look quite different. Here, the left is dark, but the right side facing the sun has become almost white to reflect the sun and prevent overheating. As temperatures change, the chameleon constantly adjusts its coloration. In the heat of midday, it may become a whiter shade of pale all over to maintain its cool and remain still in whatever shade is available. Deserts can be dangerously short on shade as well as food and drink, and yet hundreds of the world's amazing lizards survive on the burning sand. This desert lizard is not dancing, just cooling his feet. When he just can't take the heat anymore, he'll dive into the cool of a dune. To us, the cool of the sea might seem a comfortable place on an equatorial island. But for the marine iguanas of the Galapagos, the sea is a cold and risky necessity. They're descendants of South American land-dwelling iguanas castaways that floated in on rafts of drifting vegetation. Their huge claws help conquer these cliffs as they go to and from the sea. The only food for them here is offshore, the seaweeds, and the water is both cold and rough. Life for them has presented a double whammy. 
While feeding underwater, the iguanas must store heat in their body, and they do have some body fat as insulation. Claws have become anchors as the lizard grazes, holding its breath for about 20 minutes. But loss of heat is the main threat to survival. Stay too long and the cold drains energy away. Become too cold and the weakened lizard may not outrun the Galapagos sea lions, whose favourite game is to chase them ashore. Timing is critical. They need to have eaten enough so that they don't have to swim again today. And they must still have enough energy left to climb the cliffs where they will need to sunbathe. Excess salt is snorted out. And everyone settles down to getting warm enough for their bodies to digest their food. As ancient castaways, these iguanas adapted to their island life very well. They're lizards that know when to come in from the cold. Getting a grip on life for lizards means trees and rocks. A three-horned chameleon has the divided claws unique to chameleons. Three toes one side, two on the other. Ideal on these thin branches. An alternative is feet like tendrils, slender toes that this green iguana uses to clamber around trees in Central America. But the biggest walking puzzle is set by some of the geckos. How does this toke gecko, with its curious upturning toes, walk upside down on trees, ceilings and windows? Each foot has claws and special pads, and it's the pads that hold the secret of walking up the wall. They're covered in millions of tiny hairs. The hairs are capable of hooking on to the slightest irregularity, even on glass. Each hair and a tiny charge of static electricity helps to give a gecko its grip. Some lizards even need to sprint, an agama on a granite copy will have to dash for cover if the world's fastest mammal gets seriously playful. And in Australia, this frilled lizard can pursue a would-be predator. The frills make it look bigger. It's a bluff. But for this normally slow lizard, it's a winner. But in downtown Lovington, USA, They'll tell you all the winners are there. Today is the world's greatest lizard race, and uh, it's part of our 4th of July celebration here in Lovington, New Mexico. I'll tell you what, guys, let's check that fence line right over there. It's the last chance to catch these lizards today, so let's see if we can get something. The world's greatest lizard race has been a really exciting event that we've held every year. A lot of anticipation to it. The kids, you'll see them around town with buckets and mops and going through the lots, uh, trying to find a lizard. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, excitement uh, in, to the lizard race. They first started catching mountain boomers, whiptails and skinks for the 76 bicentennial celebration race. And it's no easier now than it was then. The tail was shed to distract the pursuer. No harm has been done to the escaped lizard. Most lizards can contract a special muscle to cast off their tail painlessly. A new tail will grow in a few months. There are some people that uh, have a tough time finding a lizard and we do know that the pet shop sells those lizards and uh, they're not as fast as the uh, wild uh, type of lizards that we have here. Usually the winners are ones that, uh, that are found uh, native to the, this area. There's several different techniques in catching a lizard and one of the most popular now is uh, uh, they have actually built traps or buried a bucket or a can underground with it open under high lizard traffic areas and the lizard will be walking through that area and get, get caught and... Uh, can you excuse me just a minute? I think we've got one. 
Great job, man. It's one of the whip tails, too. It's going to be one of the fast ones, man. Get ready. All right. Good job. <laughs> take six at a time. We're going to have a horn toad race. We want the crowd to get into it, guys. Have a little bit of fun. It's post time. They're off. Let's give them some encouragement. All right. Trainers may encourage their runners with feathers. Shoving is not approved of. If any lizard eats other competitors, it's disqualified. Half the town has turned up to cheer them on their way. And first place of the world's greatest lizard race and a chance to go to Orlando, Florida, goes to Ryan Roberts from Lovington. Congratulations, Ryan. All right, y'all stay there, guys. Let's get a picture here. If you could scoot back just a minute there, buddy. In the everyday race for survival, lizards need good eyesight, especially the slower moving kinds. They need to see danger coming. Sight also helps lizards to find their own food. Swiveling eyes, like those of a chameleon, may seem likely to lead to confusion from our viewpoint, but it not only spots prey, it can also keep the other eye out for predators. This Narmib chameleon is tracking a beetle. The beetle will be lucky to escape now its movement and direction have been spotted. Once the beetle stops, the chameleon reorientates its eyes. Left and right eyes converge to provide range-finding depth to the image. Target locked on. That tongue is one and a half times the length of the chameleon. The bulbous end is very sticky and strong muscles pull the tongue and captive back into the mouth. Accuracy, stealth and long range surprise in unique combination. Once it's chewing, the chameleon's turrets are scanning for new game in the African bush. Arizona. Enter the horned toad. Well, it's a lizard, really. And it feeds on ants, but only two species of them. Their formic acid is essential in its diet. The lizard's camouflage is perfect. It finds an ant's nest and sits there invisible, eating his fill for weeks on end. But the city of Tucson, Arizona, is not in harmony with the lizards there, particularly the Gila monster. Its saliva is venomous, so its bite is to be avoided, and there's no antidote. Real estate is spreading so fast that a new house may be built over a Gila monster burrow. And Gila monsters can remain hidden underground for up to two years. Every week, frightened people send for the fire department. I think people call for 
for Gila monsters um, in part because they're afraid of them. Uh, they're, they know that they can be poisonous. A lot of times people call out of fear for their animals or for their children, but I, I don't think they pose an immediate threat. Normally they don't bite unless they're antagonized somehow. Gila monsters are becoming rare animals. Rural Metro, this private fire company, relocates many of the 500 or so that turn up in the city's backyards every year. Some get crushed by traffic. A few will even find their way back, to the householder's dismay. We'll take him somewhere within the same area that we caught him, hopefully within the same square mile, and we'll let him go. Um, we try and let them go somewhat away from homes, but still in a nice desert area where he can survive. If we take them further than a mile where we found them from, that their survivability dramatically decreases. The salivating dragons on the Indonesian island of Komodo would be a much more dramatic surprise in your backyard. And the people on Komodo have had close encounters, a few of them fatal. The lizard's copious saliva is not venomous, but can easily be the cause of an animal's death. A sudden burst of speed can sometimes get the dragon into striking distance and all it will have to do is to slash at a leg with its very sharp teeth. The saliva will do the killing. The dragon plays a waiting game. Its saliva contains powerfully toxic bacteria. The injured deer very soon collapses with the infection and will quickly die. The smell of its rotting flesh brings the dragons to a feast. The dragons share the kill and reinfect their own saliva with more bacteria. Komodo is a long way from the world of Henry Lizard Lover. Anxious that lizards should not make people nervous, Henry takes a stroll on the balmy streets of Los Angeles. But there's a hidden personal agenda to his lizard evangelism. He meets a few new friends when he and his reptiles are doing lunch. I love uh, getting all the women to meet the lizards and embrace the lizards and then sooner or later I meet women that embrace me and I, I meet a lot of girls this way. It's always been a, a very rewarding thing. One way or another I've met some really beautiful fine women that uh, love the lizards and love me. He's about 10. <laughs> Romance is also in the air on Komodo Island. This male dragon's eye has been caught by a female of similar size. For such formidable creatures, their courtship is surprisingly gentle. He's smelling her with his tongue. She seems pleased by his attention. He's cautious, needing to be sure of her receptiveness. He's not looking for a fight by mistake.
pawing her gently, as well as rubbing her back with his chin. He is using dragon language for, look how strong, healthy and virile I am. He's still in a will-she-won't-she she state a few minutes later. Something isn't satisfactory to her. It's just not his day. Most lizards lay eggs after mating. These were laid by a green iguana in Central America. They've been incubating underground for some 90 days. Fully formed when they come out of the egg, these youngsters receive no motherly welcome. Every hatchling has to look after itself in a dangerous world. Green iguanas are not into maternal care, and the 40 or so newcomers from this clutch will be well equipped to survive on their own. In these vineyards in South Africa, there are lizards that do not lay eggs. The young of this Cape Dwarf chameleon are being born alive. This mother has been holding eggs in her body. The eggs hatch as they emerge, and the young lizard makes its way out. Cape dwarf babies are very small. Mother is only 12 centimeters long. It looks an undignified nursery. Mum takes no interest in their future. It can't fall far among the vines. She has given birth to some six to ten babies, and all must find their feet on their own. In times past, the chameleons have suffered when insecticides were sprayed on the vines, or they were killed by mechanical grape harvesting. But why kill so efficient a natural bug hunter? The idea is catching on, and money is saved on chemicals as the chameleons go to work in the vineyards. Plenty of chameleons means fewer pests. In a few vineyards, they now look after grapes and Cape Dwarf chameleons. The valuable reptiles are carefully removed before mechanical harvesting begins. They're taken to nearby woods, where they can hunt while the grapes are gathered. They'll make their own way back after the harvest. In Central America, lizards are big business in different ways. These men in Costa Rica are hunting iguanas in the rainforest. Green iguanas are a traditional source of meat in a country with no large wild animals and where protein is in short supply. Today, they're also big money in the foreign pet trade. An iguana at the top of this tree will be caught by its own escape method. 
frightened, it will leap for safety. If it survives, it may become another of more than 10 million iguanas exported to North America as pets in the last eight years. In some countries, trafficking lizards is depleting wild stocks at an alarming rate. When night falls, lizards face new predators. They can be sitting targets for nocturnal hunters. Sunrise in a Mexican desert even brings problems for a desert night lizard. Dusk and dawn are times favoured by many predators for hunting. Too slow to escape, off comes its tail, and the scorpion has something for its trouble while the night lizard lives to grow a new one. The next tail it grows won't detach as readily. Unlike a cat, the lizard has only two lives, not nine. Scorpions, despite their sting, are not a problem meal for an agama lizard in Africa. It may have some immunity to the sting, but it's always careful to bite it off before it swallows. And in Baja, California, one lizard will eat another. It's high noon, and there's a standoff between a collared lizard and a side blotched. The collared one watches only for movement, just like some dinosaurs are thought to have done. Even a chameleon seeking warmth at sunup finds enough energy to make breakfast of another basker that's not yet up to speed. never knew what hit it, and the chameleon sure gets a full breakfast. In this dog-eat-dog -dog world of lizards, is it possible that dragons eat dragons? The answer is yes, and it's his own family he's after. Young Komodos need to keep out of an adult's way. Being small, a youngster can climb trees. But the adult knows something's up there, and it may fall out of the branches. The adult doesn't wait around. There'll be food elsewhere. Young or old, Komodo dragons are not animals you'd expect to see in a zoo. 
No, no, you can't climb up onto my head. No. Phil Brower and Kraken the Komodo are a favourite attraction at Washington Zoo. This is Phil's rather dramatic day job. I have a real good relationship with Kraken. She's by far my favourite animal here. She's not like that with everyone. There's a few keepers where she acts a little aggressive towards, where she'll whip her tail or kind of puff up at them, which tells me they're also very intelligent animals where they can actually recognize people and almost bond towards them a little bit. Getting ready to feed Kraken now. Have a few rats we're gonna go ahead and give to her. Dragon. We actually have her trained where I whistle and then she's actually come to the point where anytime she hears a whistle, she knows right away that she's gonna get fed and she'll start running back and forth. And I have some four foot tongs where I'll put the rat on the end of that and feed it to her. Oh, 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 it's a rat. Oh, let me have it, please. Oh, you're so hungry, aren't you? Oh, I know. It's been a whole week since you've been fed. Oh, it's a rat. Got that faster than I planned. Oh, it's another rat. Kraken gets well exercised being fed like this. Phil uses the grab stick because she gets very excited. But her bite would not be as dangerous as her wild relatives. Fresh meat does not give her the poisonous bacteria in her saliva. You got the tail here. Not enough? Okay, never mind. See you later, Kraken. See you tomorrow. Our fascination for lizards, large or small, is worldwide. Questions about keeping pet lizards pour into Henry Lizard Lover's home in Los Angeles. His lizard mail is never ending, but that's what Henry and his lizards love. I've got an email here from a woman that's telling me about some um, real aggression problems she's having with her pet male iguana. He was mellow in the beginning, and now he's starting to stalk and, and try to attack her. For the past 10 years or so, I've been uh, getting so many letters and phone calls from people. They're always asking questions about diet, about behavior. A lot of times are people sharing information about their experiences with iguanas. I try to help them when I can. Not all these uh, behavior problems are, are easy to deal with when it comes to iguanas. This guy right here, this iguana, is, he's, he's very mellow and easygoing, but things can change and become just crazy aggressive, like they're gonna attack a human. And I'd like to show you what that looks like when he sees another male iguana. Let's go over here. I want you to see the potential problem there is with some of keeping some of these iguanas, especially when the males see other male iguanas. And this is why I keep them separate. Now I'm gonna show this guy to seven inside the room. They're really uh, ready to do battle. These two iguanas would love to tear each other apart. They'd kill each other. Mr. Seven is, is really worked up. Ooh boy, he's really worked up. He, He's doing the full uh, tail waggle, and he's taking a, a stance. He's standing up. He's sucking in his gut. Uh, these are all the signs, the body language, of, of rage and anger towards another male iguana. Now, see, now, they'll do this to a human sometimes and bite, and that bite is really intense. See, now, that's not the time to try to pet him. Okay, wow. Okay, wow. That's, that's really wild. It's, it's a very wild, serious behavior. Uh, now this iguana, since he's seen other male iguanas, it's, it's my theory when, when the males are able to grow up as a, as a captive pet and they see other male iguanas, then they won't be confused about a human and they won't try to attack a human. The problem is, is a lot of people raise these males alone without ever seeing other male iguanas and that's when these male iguanas will be confused and they will actually attack and stalk humans and try to attack him and viciously bite him like they would another male iguana. But he's, he's really a good guy. He knows that I'm not that other male iguana. And I'm going to put him down now and let him rest. 
Here we go. That looks good. This lizard Hollywood is one man's profitable way of telling the world these reptiles are great. But colourful, diverse and intriguing, they can inspire our imagination in real life, not only as a lizard greeting. So Henry, let's keep a sense of scale. This lizard here has a beautiful face with just the right kind of look in her eyes. And these are um, very nice proportioned hands and arms and legs. Uh, she looks great. She looks very human-like. Okay, that's good. Okay, hold it right there. That's good. Don't look at me. Look the other way. Those beautiful eyes. She uh, will sit in any position I put her in just because she's calm and relaxed. There's no tricks, she's not hypnotized. She's not afraid, she doesn't think anything's gonna hurt her in any way, and she's just calm and relaxed. Nothing concentrates the attention more than an animal that can kill you. And hundreds of us are killed every year by crocodiles and alligators. These reptiles have been top of the food chain for more than 200 million years. But there's no gratuitous aggression here. They're just doing what comes naturally. They're nature's cleanup team. Snatching the weak from the herd or scavenging the already dead, they help keep the world a healthier place. Wherever crocodiles and alligators live, humans are a late arrival. We've only been a part of their world for less than 100,000 years. And just how dangerous they can be, we've learned the hard way. So what are the secrets behind their long success? As the animals at the top of the heap, the ultimate predators. The thing about crocodiles is that they are big and dangerous predators. There's, there's no mistaking that. They'll, they'll uh, take you, they'll grab you, they'll rip your arms off, your legs off, they'll eat you. And that's what crocodiles are about. And if everybody can just accept that from the start and act accordingly, there won't be half the problems there are today. But, uh, what you have here is really the ultimate predator that's evolved and designed eat things from the water's edge. Professor Graham Webb gives it to you straight from the crocodile's mouth. He's studied Australia's crocs for over 30 years. The tale he's lived to tell is not only that these are the world's most dangerous animals, but that their behaviour is surprisingly predictable. Rob Bradle shows how. Crocodiles actually work on eyesight and vibration. Out of sight, out of mind. Now, I'm going to slip in and swim across with this big fellow. I won't splash, otherwise that'll attract him. This is not to be tried at home. Rob Bredel is putting his trust in a crocodile's instincts, unchanged in millions of years. Rob knows exactly how and why crocs do what they do. Now I'll splash. When we splash around, we act like animals in distress. And that attracts the crocodile. They can zero right into where we are. Just don't swim with them. Thank you. Gazelles, on a riverbank in East Africa, 
don't have the knowledge that Rob has acquired. They need to cross this river, but though seemingly cautious, they're unsure what crocodiles are. The leading female shows no fear of them and is doing everything she shouldn't. Other gazelles instinctively follow their leader and their splashing triggers the crocodiles to action. There's much more to crocodile behavior than an instinct to kill, but their success over millions of years owes much to their ability to learn where prey is to be found. They're not unaware of each other, but each individual is driven by an almost machine-like instinct that has been refined over time to make them the most secretive of ambushers and the most powerful of hunters. The origin of the line of reptiles leading to today's crocodiles lies far back in time. Their ancestors lived before the dinosaurs, to which the crocodiles are very closely related. They survived the mass extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and alongside turtles and their younger, more distant relatives, the lizards and snakes, they flourished as top predators. Today, 23 different crocodilians survive from the great age of reptiles, and they live in the warmer regions of the world. Most crocodiles and alligators look very similar, but size and shape does vary, often according to what they hunt. Heads can give a clue to diet. Broad heads and jaws are powerful enough to handle a wide range of prey. But narrow heads catch fish. This hunter is an Indian gharial. The very largest of crocodilians may be more than six meters long, and most adults are generally sluggish on land. But there are exceptions. This South American caiman is quite nimble. Once in the water, they're all swift and powerful swimmers. For both crocodiles and alligators, water not only hides them, but will help them to hunt fast when the moment is right. The large crocodiles of the Pacific and Indian Oceans go down to the sea. They can tolerate salt far better than most of their relatives, that are generally confined to fresh water. The secret of their success is glands in the mouth that excrete concentrated salt back into the sea 
without losing too much water from their body fluids. So what is it that all crocodilians have in common? The start of a new day in Venezuela. And it's the sun that governs the life of crocodilians the world over. Overnight, the water's been the warmest place for the crocs to be. But now they sense it's warmer on land and go ashore for a morning sunbathe. The sun's energy alone can sustain them through the day. And that's why crocodilians can survive on so little food for long periods. Unlike warm-blooded creatures that eat to sustain their body temperature, reptiles are at the mercy of the sun. Throughout the day, they must regulate their temperature by moving in and out of the water, or by gaping, which cools the head as moisture evaporates from the lining of the mouth. In the tropics, the sunlight is strong by 10 in the morning, hot enough for the crocodiles to begin a return to the water for comfort. They'll not bask again till about 4 in the afternoon. A sense of time, a sense for temperature, and many other senses keep crocodiles in touch with their world. Graham Webb. The senses of the crocodile are all concentrated ar around the head and it's really quite a remarkable sort of system because what you have is they can breathe through the end of the snout and uh, uh, sense, the sense of smell is all in here. Their eyesight is very acute and they have binocular vision so they can use their, orient their head and use it to range find and tell how far away prey is. All down here, each of these cells, scales, has sensory perception. They can feel vibration in the water and this is the hearing in here, the little ear flap in which they can uh, hear acutely and also pick up vibrations so that again if there's something vibrating, they can turn around and face it and work out exactly where it is. So that when a crocodile lifts its head above the surface of the water, it's a little bit like the periscope of a submarine and everything is alert and working, the whole sensory mechanism of the animal. And that's the sensory control behind the stealthy approach of this powerful hunter to within a metre of its prey without any hint of alarm. Now strength takes over. Jaws that can grip over 200 kilos of struggling wildebeest with apparent ease. It all happens in a blink of an eye. But what comes after capture? How does the croc get its dinner? How do crocodiles eat? Well, they do it in two ways, but the same principle is used. With the enormous pressure they have, when they take smaller animals, they just bite down, make a dotted line, pick their head up and just go shake. When they shake it, it just tears along that dotted line. A piece as big as their head is then swallowed whole. With larger animals, like dead animals on a riverbank, they come in, they go chomp onto it, then they spin, and the large animal sits still, and this just tears that piece out. Crocodiles are not only efficient at ambush and capture, they can digest almost everything, meat and bones. They waste nothing. And after a big meal, a one-ton crocodile may survive almost a year before having to feed again. An African Nile crocodile needs less than a tenth of the food that a lion must take.
They call that the death roll. Rob Bredel again. What I'm going to show you now is the so-called death roll, which is actually a feeding roll. Got a chook tied to a bullet to the string. A rope. I'm going to throw it in the front of this fellow and let him grab hold of it. When he gets hold of it, I give him resistance, see, he shakes it. He'll shake it first. He won't give resistance, he'll spin, see? And that's just to break a piece out of it, that's all. <laughs> Some power there, I tell you. It's like someone's punching the stomach. Oh. The feeding roll is an instinctive reaction and essential to deal with a large, tough carcass, such as this hippo. While some hold the carcass steady, others roll to rip pieces off. There seems to be enough to go around without a fight. But how unusual is this sharing? Crocodiles tend to be very solitary animals and they, they feed alone and look after themselves alone and don't trust their next door neighbour. But on occasion, they seem to work together. Now, sometimes this is because there's just a lot of food in one place and they all come together and they sort of decide, let's not fight each other, there's plenty of food. Other times it really does seem as though there's real cooperation where they're helping each other. But that's sort of the exception rather than the rule. The exception in action can be seen once or twice a year when the gates on this dam at Ndumo in South Africa are opened. An artificial flood races down river. Flood waters are full of barbel and other fish. This flood is out of step with the seasons, but the pace of flow triggers some fish into racing upstream, heading for their spawning rounds. Crocodiles on the river caught the smell of this flood water four days ago when it was released 160 kilometres upstream. Bottlenecks, which the fish have to leap, have become gathering places for the crocs. They're ready for the feast of fish that will jump into their jaws. The crocodiles quickly learnt to take advantage of this artificial flood, but may of course have gathered like this during natural floods for millions of years. They fish with surprising skill, and at top speed, their strike rivals the speed and accuracy of a snake. Predicting the arrival of these fish shows how quickly crocodiles can learn. They may have a small brain, but crocodiles are a lot smarter than they've been portrayed. And that intelligence goes into action with the support of powerful weaponry. Teeth are shaped to pierce or grip, to cut or to crush, but not to chew. Sensory cells detect vibration. The jaws are opened by relatively weak muscles, but powerfully closed to grip heavyweight prey. 
A valve seals the throat when the mouth is open during underwater attack. And a third eyelid, the nictitating membrane, covers the eyeball when underwater. This cover is a transparent protection, but it means that the eyes have limited focus. So a croc must use other senses, taste and vibration to locate its prey. Above water, the eyes are essential to hunting. Set high on the head with binocular vision for judging distance. The pupil, a mere slit by day, can open wide at dusk or in darkness. Look for crocodiles using torchlight and another secret of their excellent night vision shines back at you. At the back of the eye, is a mirror-like layer, the tapetum. It reflects light back into the eye, doubling its sensitivity. Crocodiles miss little, even in the dark. Most people don't think about crocodiles as communicating with each other, but in fact we've learnt that they do. And they have a really rich repertoire of visual signals and sound signals that they use, but they, they're subtle. So, for example, a crocodile can lift its head. It doesn't seem to mean much, but it actually is this crocodile saying to that crocodile, OK, I give in, you're the boss. A, a crocodile can arch its tail. That's another signal saying, I'm in a really aggressive mood. If you don't get out of the way here, I'm going to hit you. A crocodile can vibrate its sides very rapidly and generate a signal that goes right down into the water and carries a long way that tells everybody else that it's, the crocodile is there and it's aggressive. So that when you look at crocodiles, they often seem to be just sitting there doing nothing. But in fact, they're very alert, very conscious of each other and always giving little signals to each other to make sure who knows who's at the top of the peck order. Very important in crocodiles. Lifting the head is important body language at mating time. This could be a small male or female, signalling submission to a much larger male. Small females are afraid to mate with mature males because they risk injury. In this case, it looks as if the smaller animal was a male. It's being chased out of the territory. A male Indian gharial has a distinctive knob, the gara on its narrow snout. The female does not have that decorative signal. The size of the gara is a measure of a male's dominance. And the gharial can also use it to produce a buzzing sound. These badges of male rank are flaunted high. Each male knows his place. Size matters when gharials are mating. These Nile crocodiles are competing for dominance by jaw snapping, raising tails and even blowing bubbles. but it's in the Florida Everglades that the loudest advertising for mates can be heard. During the breeding season, American alligators bellow and vibrate their expanded bodies. It terrified early explorers. Underwater sounds can be heard far off, 
but their postures and bellowing assert local supremacy. Sometimes talking is not enough, and rival males come to blows. It's violent and damaging. Victor emerges. He's made his point and sent the challenger on his way, out of the territory. A smaller female alligator, like a groupie following the fight, sets about courting the male. One male may mate with several females. Unsuccessful males are forced out of the best territories. And as human populations have increased in Florida, alligators have been forced into our backyard. The alligators have a problem, but people don't see it that way. To a householder, the reptile is the nuisance, and these guys can deal with it. Pesky critters. Okay, what was the address? All right, listen, keep everybody away from him, and we'll be there as fast as we can, okay? No, we're right now, we're heading there right now. Okay, thank you. In Florida, we have over one million alligators, and we have 14 million people, so we have an alligator for every 14 people, and the alligator habitat is continuing to shrink every year. There's less and less alligator habitat, but the alligator population is going up. They're continuing to breed and reproduce. It's the alligator breeding season, and the alligators are becoming very territorial. They're fighting among themselves, chasing each other out of the area, and eventually they're ending up in the urban environment. They're really alligators looking for love in all the wrong places. Not always looking for love, unwelcome alligators turn up in some 8,000 places a year. Todd Harbuck is not the only rescuer available to retrieve them, but he gets his share, and the state licenses him to relocate the small ones and to sell the largest as meat and skin. To youngsters playing in this lake, alligators can be more than a nuisance. They can kill. Todd is surprised to find the kids playing here. He's already baited the shoreline to trap some alligators reported earlier, and he warned though. local residents to stay away. There's two of them reported out here, Jill, a 10-footer and a 6-footer. I came out last night in the rain and set some baits and on this one here. see some movement. Hopefully, this isn't the 10-footer. I hate to go in the water with one that size. Oh. Todd and his team usually set their snares overnight and bait them with fish or with an animal killed on the highway. Now they have an angry alligator in the net. All they have to do is get it from there to the truck. Right there, you. Go, 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 tighten down, tighten down. Get him off my legs. Tighten up, tighten up. All right, let's try to get him on land. Watch your feet. You got tape with you? Yeah. You don't have him real good. <laughs> Hold him steady. Let's get some tape on this guy. Hold him tight. Even with his mouth taped shut, the alligator will throw his extremely hard bony head and jaw against your shin or ankle and can actually break a bone. The tail is quite dangerous. 
the uh, scoots on this alligator are, are bony and rigid and every part of this animal can and has bruised and can severely injure you. Come here. You guys know there's a 10 foot alligator out here? Yeah, yeah we, there's two alligators. There's an 8 footer and a 10 to 12 footer. We just caught the 8 footer. See him in the back of my truck? Awesome. Yeah, you better get in here. <laughs> the big one is out here where you're playing. Okay. You didn't know there was alligators out here? You're not afraid? You guys want to see the one that we just caught? Okay. Yeah, yeah, let me see. Come on up here. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Come on up here, man. This is the baby. The baby? The baby. You're out there playing with the mama. Or in a daddy bait. They say he's ten foot or bigger. You look pretty tasty dragging behind that boat. <laughs> hey, soft soft. But well, you guys be careful out there. Pesky critters in the backyard, the patio. We're on our way. Okay. The problem is even greater in India. Millions of years ago, the rivers teemed with crocodiles. Now they teem with people. The river is central to these people's daily lives. So much so, it is considered sacred. And when life is over, it is to the sacred river they commit their dead. It would seem there is simply no room for crocodiles. Those that were here were killed long ago. They were killed not out of fear, but because crocodiles eat fish. And fishermen wanted all the fish to sell as the vital food it is in a crowded country. India's marsh crocodiles, or muggers, certainly do eat fish. But more importantly, crocodiles also prey on animals like otters that eat many more fish. So they're vital in maintaining healthy fish stocks. But the problem is one of perception. Fishermen hunted the crocs almost to extinction. The Madras Crocodile Bank was set up to save these reptiles. They hold in reserve here a healthy genetic stock ready to be released into the wild. The only problem? No one wants them there. People have always been frightened of them and they still regard crocs as competitors for food. Ron Whittaker and his son have been left holding the babies. Several thousand of them. Now their task is to promote a need for wild crocodiles. When I uh first started doing crocodile surveys in India in the early 70s, it was very apparent that India's crocodilians were in very, very bad shape. They were really on their way out, especially the saltwater crocodile and the garia. And one of the measures to sort of help things out would be to start breeding them in captivity and then offer them for restocking back to the wild, which is what we did. I started gathering up crocodiles from here and there. I had about a dozen adults and 50 babies to begin with. And Ultimately, we ended up with over 5,000 crocodiles, which is what it is today. And we've been able to supply nearly 1,000 of them to uh, various restocking projects around the country. And I think we've contributed quite a bit in the way of public education, too, because nearly a million people a year come to the croc bank. Films are made about it, and, and TV, local TV, radio interviews, and magazine articles and stuff, all which help to sort of demystify the crocodile and make people at least, if not love them, at least, you know, put up with the idea that they are a creature on this planet which has some value and some considerable interest. On a hot afternoon in Madras, visitors can see more mugger crocodiles here than in a lifetime in the wild. They're breeding too well. Crocodiles lay eggs. The staff and some local monitor lizards are eating as many as they can. Outside the crocodile bank, these animals could be vital to the future health of India's rivers and lakes. As the master predator scavenger 
in the aquatic ecosystem, crocodiles have got to be there if it's going to be a healthy ecosystem. And it might be a little bit difficult to explain this to the fishermen, but I think they do make sense out of the fact that crocodiles eat a lot of the predators of fish. They're essential to any good fisheries. Meanwhile, as they struggle to control their success at getting muggers to breed, they're having a problem with their saltwater croc. He's one of India's last giant crocodiles, and they've called him Jaws. But he's not very gentle with his ladies. Jaws is our biggest crocodile. In fact, Jaws is a 15-foot saltwater crocodile and the biggest captive croc in India. He's always been a loner, and uh, we just wanted to breed him up with one of the female salties here because, well, he's got the genes of the biggest crocs around. And we've tried this twice now. We've put females in with him, and the first time he really trashed the female quite badly. She was not badly injured, but he picked her up and threw her out right out of the water, and she was nine feet long. It was just quite startling to see it. So this time we've tried to do it a little more scientifically by putting a barrier right across the enclosure, right through the pond. The tricky bit is transferring a suitable female from one of the other pens. Yeah, I think uh, ultimately we will find a female who's compatible with Jaws. I mean, they're just like any other animals. There's a, a very definite uh, compatibility factor here. And he's used to being alone all these years, and suddenly we chuck a female in with him. He's got to get used to her. He's gotta, they've got to smell each other, they've got to get to know each other, and then I'm sure it'll happen. Australian coasts and rivers are strongholds for saltwater crocodiles. This female has mated successfully and will soon be laying her eggs. She's already built her nest, a heap of sticks and leaves that will create its own heat and humidity. It will be a natural incubator, its temperature influencing the sex of her offspring. But she'll not bury her eggs within it until nightfall. Till then, she guards her nest site from other females. In a trance-like state, she begins to lay. It's a moment Rob Breddle has been watching for. Good morning. 2.30 a.m. in the morning. We've been sitting, watching this nest for around a week now to get this crocodile laying. It's believed that crocodiles go into a state of torpor. We're going to test whether that's true or not. This is closer than I've been before. I'll just touch her on the body with me stick, and she's not moving. A little bit of a movement there. She looks like she's actually dropping an egg right now. She's actually got both the legs positioned, holding herself off the nest. So a little eggs are going to be dropping into a hole. And her feet seem to be funneling the eggs down, in fact. That's definitely a state of torpor. Oh, she just dropped one. Jeez, the hole's deep. There's one. Now this is the first time this has ever been filmed. Taking an egg from a crocodile as she lays it. I've been playing with them for 24 years. This is the first time this has happened. I'll tell you what's really exciting. Just why the mother should be torpid isn't known. She'll lay between 40 and 60 eggs. If the temperature inside the deep nest is high, most of the young crocs will be male. She'll cover the eggs and watch over the nest until they hatch. In Africa, crocodiles build a very different type of nest. This female crocodile has laid her eggs in sand, less than 50 meters from the river. 
The sand she's covering them with will keep the eggs at a modest temperature, hidden from the glaring sun, which could dry them out. She's compacting the sand firmly, and apart from a few cooling visits to the river, she'll be on guard at the nest for 90 days without eating. Her eggs are always at risk from egg thieves, such as a monitor lizard or a mongoose. A mongoose is wary of crocodiles, and the eggs of a mother on guard are safe. But this nest was vulnerable. The crocodile is away for a moment, cooling in the river. The eggs were almost ready to hatch. In Florida, an alligator mother, away from her eggs, is being called to the nest by the sound of hatchlings. Cries from both inside the eggs and from emerging youngsters summon her to their aid and protection. She cannot resist their calling instinctively clambering up to the nest. The eggs were laid deep in a mound of soil and vegetation, and some hatchlings need help to get out of the heap. Though large and heavy, the mother is surprisingly gentle at finding her family. Mother's next instinctive duty is to get her young down to the water. And remarkably, she ferries some of them there in a pouch inside her enormous mouth. While she's busy, others strike out on their own. A risky journey with so many herons, egrets and snakes around. Once in the water, they'll seek safety in numbers, clustering among the water plants. And they call to each other to stay in touch. Mother's not far away and may remain close to them for months or even a couple of years but they can't look to her for food. They are fully equipped to hunt and must fend for themselves. But they would do well not to stray far. Only one in a hundred will make it to adulthood. Parental care can only go so far. For the young alligators or these Nile crocodiles, it's a jungle out there. Mother's jaws can grip and slice a hefty wildebeest. But when she gathers her young into the cage of teeth, she's gentleness itself. Safe in the pouch of her mouth, she delivers some of her family to the water. These are the lucky ones. 
A hungry monitor lizard is exploring the unguarded nest, and its efforts are rewarded. While young, even these top predators are bottom of the heap. Fish, fowl, reptiles and mammals plunder the crocodile's young. But there are ways of fighting back. Young caimans in Venezuela have been clustered together in a caiman crash. So much prey in one pond seems to confuse predators. There are hundreds of youngsters, all in the care of one adult. A single nursemaid in charge of everyone's offspring. But for how long are any young crocodiles safe from their own kind? As a baby, this youngster was at no risk from adult crocs. But from about one year old, it's been on the menu. For the first four or five years of its life, it needs to be wary of adults that may associate its size with prey and not as one of them. It was the right size for prey and the top predator asks no other questions. Twelve years old, and a crocodile is maturing fast. In a year or so, a male will have a territory and be looking for a mate. The crocodile is now the ultimate predator and everything is potential food. There is only one relatively new problem. Humans. Crocodiles lived hundreds of millions of years without us, and they have no aggressive grudge against us. We simply look and move like any other prey. Even a grown man is an easy target for a large crocodile, yet some people have to live with them. The real problem with crocodile attacks around the world is with the people who live in the exact same areas that crocodiles live in. It's not with the people who live in the cities around the world who do their hunting and gathering in supermarkets. It's with the people who depend on the same areas as the crocodiles do for their water, for their food, for their livelihoods. This is where most of the world's crocodile attacks occur because Everyone's survival is dependent on using the exact same resource. They're in full competition. In Australia, they relax around crocodile-infested waters. There are plenty of signs, warnings and instructions. But where people relax, common sense often forsakes them entirely. Forget for one moment that a crocodile is the boss and that you are the stranger on his patch and that you look like food to him and you'll make the evening news. Trying to drag Mrs Panquee to the river, the croc lacerated her chest and liver. She's now in intensive care in Darwin. Meadows is the second person to die a gruesome death following crocodile attacks in the past two weeks. Conservation Commission rangers then began their hunt for the suspected killer croc in earnest, and in the small hours of Thursday morning, they caught and killed a four and a half meter monster. A quick examination of its stomach content revealed more decaying human remains. The severed head of the slaughtered reptile, along with the human remains, had been flown to Darwin. To what Darwin. makes crocodiles so dangerous is they can hide in almost nothing. They can hold their breath for hours and lay motionless for hours. They're what I call the ultimate waiter. Now here, the water isn't very deep, you'll notice. That's how deep it is. About there. Yet there's a big fellow just laying there, nearly four meters long and 400 kilos. If I splash something in the water, watch. Mm. 
Wop is gotcha. Could it have been the reptile's primeval ferocity that led the first settlers of crocodile country to hunt them so mercilessly? Hundreds of thousands were slaughtered. In Australia, the saltwater crocodile was almost extinct by the 1970s. But today, that's all changing. Crocodile farming is becoming big business. Licensed to raise crocodiles in pens and enclosures, these farmers are not trying to impress tourists, but are helping Australia's wild crocodile populations, from which they are authorised to take some eggs. Only by protecting and maintaining healthy wild crocodiles and the land they nest on will there be surplus eggs for sale to the crocodile farmers, and that money helps preserve the wild heritage of crocodiles, a resource hundreds of millions of years old. These are reptiles of immeasurable value. What we've learned over the last 30 years is that you can't isolate crocodiles and look after them in a national park. It, you, the answer to crocodile survival is for people to depend on crocodiles and for crocodiles to depend on people. Once the crocodile's life and the people's life are dependent on each other, then they both tend to look after each other. You can't help but be impressed by a crocodile. I mean, some people might call them the ultimate killing machines, but that's just part of it. They're also the ultimate submarines. And uh, I don't know, they're just so impressive. A kind of reptilian intelligence, which is a bit scary. They're able to think and work things out. Speed, curiosity, and uh, a survivorship like no other animal in the world. The future of crocodiles, I think it's pretty good. My aim is to show people that crocodiles are totally instinctive and that we can live with them side by side. We just have to understand him. He's been around for over 240 million years and I think he's gonna see us out too. I think he's pretty secure. The world of 200 million years ago was presented with some of the strangest animals that had ever lived. Nothing about them suggested they were to become a huge success. But these first turtles were among the first of the Earth's great dynasties of reptiles. Turtles then, and turtles now, are unique. Their bodies are encased in armour, and that shell has changed little over millions of years. They colonised most of the world, varying greatly in size. But wherever they live, the basic shape of a turtle's body remains the same. Some land-dwelling turtles, or tortoises, are quite small. Others have become famous as giants, several feet long. Some long-necked types are at home in and out of fresh water. They and these shorter-necked turtles are known as terrapins. Two hundred and fifty-seven species, all variations on the theme of turtle, exist. From the driest of deserts to the cold extremities of the earth. Those that are gentle vegetarians have become welcome visitors to our homes. The others hunt out of our view. Older than the birds, all turtles may owe their success to their simple design. But what future is there for turtles? Living life 
in a shell. Powderham Castle is the ancestral home of Lord Devon. It's also the home of Timothy, a rather venerable tortoise. To the present Lord, he's the oldest member of the family. Timothy first came into our family in 1892, and he previously belonged to Captain Rutherford, who was a sea captain, um, and undoubtedly he was on board ship um, for quite a long time. And this has given rise to a number of uh, myths about Timothy's beginnings, that he belonged to pirates and all this sort of thing, which aren't strictly true. He's outlived um, a, a number of uh, Earls of Devon. I think um, at a quick count it's about seven, or, or maybe I'm either the seventh or eighth that, that, that he's known. The suggestion is that Timothy is at least 162 years old. I think he mostly lives on sort of clovers and things, but his favourite really is, is, is strawberries. Now, oh, my son, what about that? He's been known to make a mistake when he uh, is wanting a strawberry, and we once had a, a lady with painted red toenails, and she got rather a sharp nip on the toenail. But, uh, he doesn't make too many mistakes, he knows usually what he's got. I don't know that he's terribly hungry at the moment. No. I think it's too cold for eating today. Counting growth rings on the shell is not a reliable guide to a tortoise's age. They sometimes eat little and so grow little. They live life at a slow pace and that may be a reason for Timmy's record age. The fossil record is our best guide to the history of Timmy's ancestors. The first we know lived some 300 million years ago in the world of forests that gave us our coal. From such primitive reptiles, turtles diverged first, leaving dinosaurs and other reptiles to go their own way. Turtles of fantastic size and diversity went from strength to strength. They saw snakes emerge 100 million years ago and witnessed the extinction of the dinosaurs. That turtles have survived so long is due to the extraordinary design of the shell that protects their body. The shell has remained virtually unchanged for 200 million years. A thick layer of hardened scale is its first line of defense. But a broad bony layer the carapace provides strength. In other animals, this bone would be ribs. The turtle's backbone is fused to the shell. It's the support under the bridge. The shell has served the turtles well, but at a cost. On land, it's heavy, restricting movement. But underwater, in a streamlined form, the shell allows graceful swimming with surprising speed. Power is provided by huge front flippers. Sea turtles migrate thousands of kilometers, swimming on the ocean currents. Their hind limbs are mainly used as rudders for steering. Legs have no appeal for these sailors. Sea turtles only emerge onto land to nest and even then, flippers are sufficient to haul the turtle over a beach. Freshwater turtles, or terrapins, do have legs, with webbed toes to propel their streamlined shell. When feeding on the bottom of a lake or river, legs are more useful than flippers. But terrapins also climb out of the water, so their legs are essential. A 
A tortoise, walking on land all the time, needs strong legs, in this case to carry it out of danger. The pancake tortoise also has a flattened shell that fits a handy crevice. A caracal is well able to spot a meal in these cracks, but the shell of this tortoise, being flexible, can be wedged tight in the rock. All turtle shells are for protection, and this pancake tortoise's casing quite defeats the inquisitive cat. Giant tortoises, and this one on a Galapagos island is among the largest in the world, have no natural predators to hide from, but they need weightlifters' legs to move their massive shell. This one is hauling a house that weighs some 130 kilos and is over three centimetres thick. A tiny box turtle leads a far more troubled life in raccoon country, but its domed shell has a cunning device that usually outwits such hunters. It's time to take evasive action. The shell is hinged. The drawbridge comes up and all of the turtle, head, limbs and tail, is safe inside its castle. Only when the raccoon retreats will the turtle venture out. That hinge on the lower shell saved its life. The turtle shell has survived some huge challenges over millions of years. But sometimes, no matter how good the design, the odds can be against it. That is one lucky tortoise. Surviving the heat of a desert is a particular challenge for tortoises. They can only control their temperature by moving into and out of the sun. Dr. Jeff Lovich of the United States Geological Survey is radio tracking a desert tortoise on a wind farm in California. Desert tortoises have recently started to decline, and Jeff wants to find out why. Well, here's one of our females. Hello. It's getting a little warm out here, isn't it? It's only nine o'clock right now, but it's already hot out here. It's probably 95 degrees, and it's going to be 115 before the day is over. She's heading for the burrow off to my right. The tortoise needs the burrow to survive and protect itself from the extremes that are so characteristic of the desert. The temperature can rise to 45 degrees Celsius, 15 degrees more than even this tortoise could survive out in the open. Look at her walking into my shadow. Desert tortoises take advantage of every opportunity they can to become cool in the midday sun. At the other end of the thermometer, Extremes of cold present their own challenge. Some turtles in Canada can survive freezing temperatures. Called painted sliders, their frozen bodies are not drawing breath and their hearts are not beating, and yet they are not dead. These hatchlings, born in August, freeze and unfreeze throughout the winter until the final thaw in spring. How the cells of their bodies survive this, nobody knows. Yet the painted sliders leave their nest and start active life unharmed.
Such marvellous abilities to survive were entirely to the turtle family's advantage until humans appeared on the horizon. In the centuries before refrigeration was invented, it was sailors who took advantage of the turtle's special qualities. Turtles can survive for several months without food, so could be carried aboard as a supply of fresh meat. Killing turtles for their tasty meat is a very ancient practice. Wham! That's a direct hit. It's painless for the turtle, though, because we use a special kind of harpoon point, just enough of it to penetrate his tough layer of shell. That is now known to be nonsense. Nerve endings by the hundred fill both shell and bone, but myths die as hard as the turtles. These turtles weigh from 300 to 500 pounds, and their age is estimated at a pound to the year. By the start of the 20th century, over-exploitation had brought some kinds of turtle to the brink of extinction. And today, turtle soup and meat consumption continues, despite international laws which attempt to protect those turtles whose survival is threatened. The turtle may well be our defenseless victim, but in the natural world, these successful reptiles have for a long time been well able to defend themselves. Tiger sharks and their relatives do kill sea turtles in deep water. But in these shallows, this loggerhead turtle can spring a surprise. turtle is biting the shark. It has no teeth, but the sharp serrated plates in its strong jaws can inflict serious injury. And the shark is also unable to manoeuvre freely in shallow water. After a breath of air, the valiant turtle can return to feeding. It can give as good as it gets. A loggerhead turtle eats a variety of seafoods, but its beak is ideal for capturing hard-shelled prey. This crab is in for the big crunch. Freshwater, a camouflage turtle is hunting, a matter matter. It will blend with the fallen leaves when it stops and wait for a fish to come within range. Its trick is to suck them in. The fearsome jaws of an alligator snapping turtle gape and reveal a worm-like appendage on its tongue. Lured by its wriggling, a fish investigates this death trap. And there are even turtles that hunt together. Donald Striden knows that visitors to his Swadini reptile park in South Africa are fascinated by the bloodthirsty terrapins he exhibits there. It's feeding time in the terrapin pool. You know, if I had to put my finger into this water, they would eat it. Um, but I'm going to give them something else to eat, their favourite food, a little piece of uh, chicken here. And uh, if I lower that down, they're going to move towards this. Come, guys. Come on. You'll probably find that the red ear terrapins come first. They are normally the more dominant. And here comes one now. You can see why it's called a red-eared terrapin. It's got the little red mark behind the eye. 
And look at that. He's a dominant one. So he, he will come first. And here comes one of the serrated hinged terrapins on the side here. And the rest of them are going to respond to the movement. In fact, they would have to eat in colonies. They can't easily, as you can see here, bite off a chunk of uh, meat on their own. So they'd need to tear it amongst each other. They'd eat in much the same way as piranhas. So lots together, biting off chunks and pieces of meat. And you can see that happening right here now. Reddy has got a really good grip on it. They tear at the meat. This is all very necessary in nature. They clean up the place. They're in fact the aquatic hyenas. Forget big game watching here. Keep your eyes on these little guys. Eating chicken on a plate in the reptile park is nothing compared with how these terrapin terrorists feed in the wild. The predator sizes up its prey, qualia birds, which flock in thousands. One terrapin grabs a bird, the others crowd in to snatch what they can. Even birds as big as doves are not immune from the helmeted terrapin's submarine attack. A lone terrapin could overcome the dove, but hungry rivals are on their way. And turtles can be even more competitive when it comes to mating. The birds of Dassan Island, off the Cape Coast of South Africa, share their tiny home not only with rabbits, but also with more than 10,000 tortoises. But not until the temperature climbs to 24 degrees Celsius do they show themselves. Male angulated tortoises hold territories and once they've warmed up, they begin to chase females on their patch. Once he's found one, he'll not easily let her go. So far, so good. But he's chased her onto another male's territory, which will upset his plans. They do battle, a duel in the sun. But a third male has seen an opportunity and is mating with their female. Neither the combatants nor the vigorously mating couple show signs of giving in. By the time the fight reaches its climax, the mating's also over. The loser may even lose his life. He must right himself or else fry in the sun. The temperature is rising rapidly. He must get into the shade. But that's hard to find with 10,000 competitors. His answer is to dig in, covering head and limbs and using his shell as a sunshade. Sea temperatures in tropical waters are much the same all year round. And these male green turtles near Borneo will mate whenever a receptive female is available. The males have the long tails. They're all pursuing one female. A male succeeds in locking onto her shell and mating with her. Rival males are surprisingly vicious in trying to interrupt his success. These powerful jaws can injure a flipper, and not only the mated male, but other rivals are also getting bitten. But to no effect. 
the desire to mate is strong, and only when he has succeeded will other males have a chance to take his place. sea or on land, turtles breed with little problem, but on the unique islands of the Galapagos in the eastern Pacific, a crisis has arisen. At the Charles Darwin Research Station, the fortunes of all the famous Galapagos Island tortoises are being carefully monitored. These tortoises are giants, among the largest in the world, and they are more than just a tourist attraction they're endangered, and their survival depends on them breeding in captivity here. In the wild, giant tortoises have faced various threats to their survival. The idea is to restock each island with its own kind of tortoise. These baby tortoises are the hope for the future. Each island has its very own type of giant tortoise found nowhere else, and in each of these pens, babies are being nurtured until ready to be taken to their particular island home. In past centuries, boats landed on each island to plunder the docile giants, killing or collecting them. Today's boat is helping to redress the balance bringing in young tortoises to replace those that were taken. This is the island of Española. The Española tortoise was once facing almost certain extinction. Now the future arrives in a bag. A thousand young tortoises have been released like this, all bred from just 15 adults collected in the 1970s. They should be safer than they've ever been. Their only enemy was people, and now the poacher has turned gamekeeper. In 20 years, they should all be as big as this adult. But this success has not been repeated for the tortoises of Pinter Island. The last remaining resident of Pinter is living out his old age at the Charles Darwin Research Station. They call him Lonesome George. More than 70 years old, he is the last of his species. All the others starved when introduced goats ate the plants of Pinter and shipborne rats ate the tortoise eggs. Zoos and private collections worldwide have failed to turn up a relative. And even if a mate were found, he could be too old to breed. The Pinter Island tortoise may be the first turtle species to become extinct in the 21st century. The future of many of the world's turtles is a matter of concern. Even the olive ridley sea turtles, famous for their mass egg laying on this beach in Costa Rica, are arriving in fewer numbers each season. Randall Arouse is familiar with the spectacular Arabada, as it's called, here at Ostianal. Ever since I was a very young boy and I was always interested in marine biology, but then one day, it was 1982, I was a second year biology student, I walked into the school and there was a big sign that said, Arribada, we need volunteers. And I thought, well, I've heard about the Arribadas and the turtle nesting. I should go check it out. Then I came to Austinal, right here at this spot. And I saw the Arribada happening. And right then it struck me. Like I've had to study turtles and I've been doing turtles ever since. During a season, as many as 200,000 turtles might haul out onto this beach on one night. 20 years ago, it would have been a million. But this is still the second biggest Arribada in the world. The turtles are right now congregating right out there. They're going to congregate in what we call the float. And they'll start coming up after the sun goes down. 
and probably by midnight or one in the morning, we're going to have a very high concentration of turtles nesting here on this beach, and they're not going to finish until sunrise, probably about eight or nine in the morning. So yeah, it's going to be some pretty, pretty heavy work all night long. We basically know that these turtles come for two or three consecutive arribadas in a row. Then they're going to leave and we won't see the turtle again for another year or another two years. The arribada that we're witnessing now may easily have 100,000 turtles participating. And 100,000 turtles at 100 eggs per turtle, roughly, that means 10 million eggs. Eggs are the turtles' investment in their own future. But eggs can also produce illegal income for poachers. So patrols of armed guards protect these nesting turtles all night against egg thieves. This female may have mated with several males offshore. So each of the 60 to 100 fertilized eggs she buries in the nest may have a different genetic composition, which is healthy for the future of Olive Ridley turtles. Randall can also inspect the health of an individual while she is laying. She seems to be unaware of him and in a kind of trance. He examines her gently for signs of disease or injury while she is in this curious semi-conscious state. Just why she enters this trance is not yet known. The studies carried out on this beach indicate that roughly 8% of all the eggs laid on this beach will actually hatch and turn into little turtles. Now, that does not mean that these little turtles will turn, will turn into adults. A wild guess is one out of 100. This beach at Ostianal is only seven kilometers long and turtles are still arriving to nest at dawn. There's not much space left for these stragglers, and some inevitably dig up the nests of others. Many eggs get damaged. There's huge natural wastage. The collection of eggs is important to the local economy, but local people are only allowed to take them for the first 36 hours of an Arabada. It's a conservation plan they're happy with. The community of Ostinal protects their turtles in many ways. Probably the main way is they respect the management plan. There are rules as to when you can harvest, when you can't, and the community as a whole complies. You can only harvest the eggs for the first 36 hours. The eggs have to be packaged in a special way. There has to be receipts, there's all this paperwork. And the people of Ostinal comply with all these rules and regulations to their very best and they get a good harvest without harm to the turtles. Soft-shelled, the eggs travel well to a luxury market where some are enjoyed over the bar in a pricey drink they call boca. He seems to like it. Land turtles, such as the Californian desert tortoise, face greater problems now that more and more people are living where they do. This rivalry concerns Jeff Lovich. When you look at what people have done to the desert in the last 100 years, it's amazing that it's survived. I mean, here we have this rugged old touchstone, a place that looks timeless, yet it's changing very rapidly, in a place that was formerly virtually empty of people and now sits in between Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles, some of the most highly populated cities in the United States, and we put roads in through the whole desert. We've driven over it in our motorcycles, our trucks, and our off-highway vehicles. We've uh, encouraged the spread of exotic species of plants and animals that are changing the landscape of the desert very rapidly. And the desert tortoise has become the flagship species for conservation in the Mojave Desert. But it has a very uncertain future in terms of how it's going to be able to survive in this onslaught of human population increase. It's perhaps its own cuteness and charm that is a desert tortoise's worst enemy. People like to have one at home. Problems arise when the once loved pet outgrows its welcome. It seems so easy and kind to let it go in the wild.
But Fred, or whatever his pet name has been, is about to cause problems among the wild tortoises he will inevitably meet. He appears to have a cold, a viral infection that he'll soon pass on to others. A whole population of desert tortoises may die because one unwanted pet was carelessly released. We present tortoises with other problems close to towns with tarmac roads. Our roads cross their territories. They get injured. Have a very injured turtle. Okay, Another casualty for the vet. But this one is not from a traffic accident. Hi, what do we have here? Oh, let's have a look. Poor thing. Oh, looks like it's been chewed up by a dog or a coyote or some kind of a predator. Okay, this is just like dead skin, dead scales, so this doesn't hurt. This is just like peeling dead skin off. Fiberglass can be used to repair a tortoise's bodywork. Sometimes I feel like a cook when I'm doing this. Cover up, but we'll put it, cover it up with another layer, and it should do fine. Because of the fact that it's clear, we can see through it and see what that tissue looks like in there. So if it ever got to a point where that tissue started looking bad, we'd be able to take this shell patch off and get in there and treat it. All right. Convalescence for that injured turtle Meredith? is available here with Dan Touchstone of the San Diego Turtle Society. Turtles are able to survive much more severe injuries than a mammal because of their shell and a much slower constitution. Strawberry? Ah, come on, you want it. He also has orphans in his care, unwanted pets. Morning puddles. All are pampered here. How you doing, big guy? Breakfast time for you. Yeah, there you go. Puddles, you were about the size of a walnut when we got you. Here you go. I know you're hungry. The other side of America in Florida, turtles have acquired a special friend, Richard Moretti, who's a bit surprised by his new passion. I moved to the Keys in 1983 and started fishing. Everybody said, oh, you're so great. You came to the Keys to save the animals. No, I came to kill the fish. It just, living in the Keys changes you you appreciate the environment a little more. Okay, yeah. she'll be She's out here by the end of summer. Better, yeah. And these are the new babies? Concerned by encountering well, sick and injured yeah. turtles in the late 1970s, Richard yeah, set up the, the Florida Turtle Hospital and staffed it with a dedicated yeah. veterinary team. Is she swimming? Well, she'd have to get a little larger, but yeah. Uh, yeah, she's swimming okay and she's eating just fine. I filled an old saltwater swimming pool uh, with uh, tarpon and grouper and snapper and all the children that came to visit said, do you have any turtles? So in 1986, we went to the state of Florida and said, how do we get sea turtles? They said, well, the only way you can have them is to do something for them. And I said, well, what would you like us to do? They said, well, we need a rehabber. And they said, a rehabber, if a turtle gets hit by a boat, we take it to the vet and pay the bill. We uh, buy the food and pay the bill. And when it's ready, we turn it out. I said, well, I can do that. And that was our very modest start of the sea turtle hospital. Guys, eat Watch up. your legs. Watch I got him. There he goes. OK, that's perfect. Good. But before I uh, moved to the Keys, I ran a Volkswagen facility, and Volkswagens would come in broken, and my job was to find the best mechanics and the best parts. Well, this is the same. The turtles come in broken, and my job is to find the best vets and the best meds. It's the same, except uh, now instead of having to give them the bill, I pay the bill, and that even makes it nicer. There you go. Oh, Thanks, Doc. And I didn't get too wet. <sighs> this little tumor is the beginning of a virus that affects sea turtles around the world. This disease started 100 years ago. When we first started seeing it 15 years ago in the Keys, turtles would come in with a singular tumor like this. Uh, this turtle's evidently just gotten the disease because he's only got a couple of very small tumors, which we'll take off. And once we do, that'll immunize her against the disease. We'll keep her for a year, we'll make sure she doesn't grow anymore, and then we'll let her go. It appears to be a herpes virus, very similar to herpes simplex one and two, 
and it's affecting turtles worldwide. Uh, right now, all eight species of turtles have a similar lesion. We haven't been able to get tissue samples to make sure it's the same virus, but we've gotten tissue samples from about half the turtles around the world, and all the ones we've been able to examine are about 95% positive to the same virus. Okay. Some turtles infected with this herpes virus arrive in a much more advanced stage of the disease. The team intends to do everything they can, but this turtle has been greatly weakened by the growths. Notice the contrast difference. You have a radio opacity here. Notice it's not bone dense and it's not soft tissue dense. I'm concerned about these. We definitely need to go in, do the endoscopy and document that they're there with, the, uh, with some digital photographs. Okay. And the reason, too, that we have her on her back like this is that way we don't accidentally poke into something like an intestine or a bladder. Here, so you know we're in. That's got to make her feel so much better. Okay, gang, here we go. I'm going to pass this directly in. There we go. The endoscope does not Stay reveal out. good news. They can recognize large tumors within her body. In the wild, she may not have lived much longer. All right, we have what we need. OK, now we need to roll her back over, okay. because I need to put a uh, suture, suture in there. Suture in there, OK. Well, that's not good news for this baby, unfortunately. No. Easy. They can do nothing for her except ease her pain and put her to sleep. The joy of success always makes up for the sadness of failure. And today, four rehabilitated turtles are going home. They look like they're ready. Yeah, after never being out of a tank, they're gonna enjoy this big tank called an ocean, huh? All right, have lots of babies, guys. Are you ready for this? You look ready. You're beating me up already? You got your jewelry? Yeah. OK. You can go. Moments like this reassure Richard Moretti that their work is worthwhile. All right, yeah. guy. Shall we send them in pairs? All right. Sounds good to me. All right, they're roommates. They've been roommates. <laughs> OK, there they go. Ready? Usually when you see wildlife being worked on, it's usually on a picnic table with a buck knife. But we've built a state-of-the-art facility to give these animals the care they really need. Those little turtles that were just released, when they came in, they had been trapped in roots when they were born and they struggled to get out. They were cut all the way to the bones, all over their body from struggling with those roots. Uh, it took us two years to get them ready and you saw those were nice, healthy turtles. And the feeling, taking a wild animal that's gonna live a lot longer than I will, back out into the ocean and turning it loose for future generations. Well, you can see, goosebumps. It's great. Nothing feels better than being able to put something back for the future. Every day, Turtles can be seen enjoying the attentions of cleaner fish in the wild. They're every bit as caring as the veterinary hospital. The fish feed on algae, and in doing so, clean the turtle's shell. It's a partnership that is millions of years old. Generation after generation lived in what might seem to have been a perfect world. But change is sweeping through the ocean. Commercial fishing puts nets into the sea, but nets break loose and drift, catching much more than is intended. These death traps will also snare and drown frightened turtles. Helplessly bound, they cannot swim to the surface to breathe. Netting for shrimps has taken its toll of turtles. In the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, in the southeast region of the United States, we uh, estimated that approximately 40,000 sea turtles were 
uh, killed incidental to shrimp trawling. And this problem created a need for either a shutdown of the fishery or the development of some apparatus or a technique to exclude the sea turtles from the trawl. What they developed was TED, a turtle exclusion device. It's tested inside the trawl net of a working fishing boat. The net is being dragged behind the boat and the TED is fixed inside the net at the end. The idea is that a turtle in the net hits the device, is pushed up the ramp and escapes through the top of the net. Only a live turtle can test it. In this situation, a turtle would normally be fatally trapped with the shrimps. But on reaching the TED, the turtle, much bigger than shrimps, hits the bars, is guided upwards and out into the sea, none the worse for its experience. It's a simple invention, but it saves the lives of many turtles. And the use of TEDs desperately needs to be encouraged worldwide. Here in Central America, we know that in Costa Rica at least, at least 15,000 turtles are being caught a year. And of course, this is definitely going to have an impact on the population. There's a dead turtle right over there, you can see, um, almost definitely killed by a shrimper. Um, if Costa Rica was implementing TEDs efficiently, this would no longer be the case. In the sands of this beach at Ostianal, the olive ridley turtles have been developing for some 60 days. What happened under the sand as the eggs hatched is quite special. The eggs at the bottom of the nest hatch first. The hatchlings climb to the top of the chamber and down below, sand fills the space they left. As more hatch, the floor is gradually lifted to just below the surface and the hatchlings emerge together. Once out of the nest, hatchlings must head for the sea. But how do they know where it is? Light is a crucial factor for orientation. The sea is always brighter than the land. It's often suggested that having fixed their compass bearings, they'll be able, when adult, to find their way back and lay their own eggs on the very same beach. Turtles also hatch in daylight. Most race directly for the ocean, but they can now be seen by predators. Theirs is a lonely and dangerous journey. On this beach, almost every animal has a taste for turtle. But predators, such as this black vulture, don't have it all their own way. Survival of the turtles is important to the local people. When the turtles are hatching, the women all organize and they go to the beach, they shoo the predators away to make sure that the little turtles can make it into the water. They try to make sure that all these little turtles make it to the water safely, because of course it's to their best interest to make sure that these little turtles make it to the water, they eventually turn into adults and come back and participate in an arribata 10 years down the road. Although some 10,000 hatchlings will survive to become adult turtles, remember, 10 million eggs were laid in these sands. Help like this may seem a drop in the ocean, but the next big wave will sweep them to freedom. 
and once these youngsters are safely out to sea, they will be able to drift away on the currents. No one knows where they go. Perhaps they hide from ocean predators among floating seaweed, where they can safely feed and grow. But it will be 15 to 20 years before they return to these waters. Before people ever began helping turtles to survive, alligators had been unwittingly doing so for millions of years. Young red-bellied turtles are hatching from eggs laid in the alligator's nest. The rotting heap is warm and humid, as good for incubating turtles' eggs as it is for hatching alligators. The red-bellied turtles have a lot to thank the alligator for, but their reptilian benefactor is, in a way, rewarded. Alligators eat a good many adult red-bellied turtles. For 200 million years, turtles, with their curious bodies encased in their remarkable shell, have endured all manner of change around them. Today's world is unlike that of long ago. The oceans threaten with human pollution and greed. Ancient homelands have become deserts. Islands are overrun by vermin. Any future for these reptiles now depends on our caring about them and caring for them. We don't know really what role they play in, in the overall uh, scheme of things with the ecosystem. And I think that's one reason why we should use any means to protect them. There are many, many animals that we really don't, humans don't see a, uh, a need to, to spend the effort and the time to conserve, but uh, just the fact that we, we don't know, um, I think, means that we should. Throughout the world, irrespective of culture, there is an affinity for the turtle. Throughout the world, we have myths that ascribe various characters and features to turtles that we like to teach our children, like being steadfast and being resolute. Here in this country, we have our own myth about the tortoise and the hare, and we teach our children that being steady and continuing to run the race can lead to victory. You don't have to be the fastest, you don't have to be the best. This year we were really excited. One of the turtles that we took a flipper off of last year and turned her loose, it was a great big female, probably about 50 years old. She crawled up on a beach in central Florida and laid eggs this year. And that's really exciting because, you know, up to that point people usually kept turtles with one flipper in an aquarium or in, an, uh, or in a, a, a park. Well, we proved that uh, three flipper turtles can go out there and add to the genetic makeup and they can actually crawl up on the beach with three flippers and have their babies and lay their eggs. They're 200 million years old. Those are living fossils that we put back in the ocean. And hopefully with a, a lot of help from our friends that help us work on turtles, we'll see them into the next millennium. But it makes you feel really good. You know, we use so much of our assets and uh, our environment up. It's so nice to put something back for the future. This uh, cobra here was found in the rubble here of my garden, and that's very common. You often find cobras in situations like this, and it's an amazing snake. Most people think it's one of the most aggressive snakes. They think that this is a, a snake that will intentionally attack you, it will go for you. That's not aggression. That snake's merely trying to warn me off. It's standing up so that I can see it, and I'm supposed to now move away from it. If I move around it here, you'll see how it follows me. It's, of course, going to follow every step that I make. Snakes respond to movement, the cobra especially. I'm going to show you something really interesting here. This uh, the cobra is really warning me with its hood. And if I grab it really gently and restrain it, hold it like this for a moment, once the snake feels that it's completely overpowered, once it feels that it cannot do anything else, that it cannot move away from me, cannot spread its hood, biting's not working, it may do something which is going to really interest you. It may 
pretend to be dead. And even if I move my hand over it, it's responding completely differently to the way it was a moment ago. Isn't that incredible? Snakes are so fascinating. Snakes are reptiles most of us prefer not to meet. And they're not too keen on us, which is why they hiss or rattle to warn us off. Such warnings are ignored at our peril. But a snake will only bite in defence, and only if it feels gravely threatened. It's easy to imagine the snake as an aggressor. The snake in the grass, a deadly foe. But why does this image send a shiver of fear down our spine? In shape and movement, they are so different from us that legend and folklore has given them a sinister reputation they don't really deserve. How can we understand an animal that smells with its tongue? Or that hears with its whole body, sensing vibrations? The hypnotic stare of its unblinking eye can seem as alien as its apparent rebirth through the shedding of its skin, sloughed off like a scaly ghost of itself. Among them are giants that storybooks say are a hundred feet long and ready to strangle unwary jungle explorers. And yet there is this little guy, a thread snake, highly companionable and not at all deadly. There is even a beauty and a grace in some that go upon their bellies silently through the trees. But where did snakes come from? The answer is rather surprising. An animal that looked much like some other reptiles alive today. It's hard to believe that snakes have anything in common with creatures like this. But in fact, they all descend from the same ancestor. This primitive ancestor led to two groups of animals, turtles and all other reptiles. All through the age of the dinosaurs and during the emergence of lizards, snakes were nowhere to be seen. But there were legless lizards, and it was from these that snakes evolved. For 110 million years, they have been living side by side with other reptiles. Today, there are more than two and a half thousand different species of snake. Hidden within their bodies, vestiges remain of the legs they lost. But snakes, with a skull, backbone and a multitude of ribs, are able to move quickly in several ways. The serpentine crawl of the cobra. Most snakes move like this. Muscles create little banks in the ground, which the snake pushes against to propel itself forward. When you're short and fat like this puff adder, throwing cobra-style loops is impossible. Instead, the muscles act on the ribs. As the ribs move, the snake's scales gain purchase on the ground and with a series of rhythmical contractions, the snake rows along in the sand. The famous sidewinder favours the serpentine wave, and like the cobra, it can push against the ridges it nudges up in the sand. By moving sideways, it needs only two points of contact on the very hot sand. At any one time, most of its body is held in the air, 
legs. Who needs them? Quite different problems face a tree climbing python in a rainforest. To reach across a gap, it can stiffen sections of its body, becoming its own ladder from branch to branch. This sinuous and flattened body with its broad tail working like an oar could be mistaken for an eel. But this is no fish. It's a sea snake. Most snakes can swim, and even the sea snake must interrupt its hunting now and then for a breath of air at the surface. As hunters, in water or on land, snakes are silent and efficient killers, the commandos of the animal world. A rattlesnake has more than a bite in its armoury. Its tongue constantly tastes the air, scenting for prey. Its body senses ground vibrations, even the footfalls of a mouse. And standing still is no defence. It's body heat that reveals the mouse to the rattler's secret weapons. Infrared heat, detected by sensory pits each side of the face, pinpoints the prey. So, high-tech weaponry has been around long before ours. But in any combat situation, defence is as important as attack. The lob lolly, a rare pine tree, is home to the rare red cockaded woodpecker. But both are safe within the military training ground. Though the woodpecker does have an enemy within, a corn snake. Its tactics are to climb and rob the woodpecker's nest. Outside this military zone where there are no lob lolly trees, the woodpeckers have no defence against snakes. But here, the bird can defend its chicks by pecking this tree and releasing resin. But how can resin repel this relentless invader? It's getting close. Will the woodpecker's secret weapon really work? The resin goes into action. Seeping between the scales, it irritates the snake's skin. Corn snakes nil. The woodpeckers, one. Australia, home to the most venomous snakes in the world. In these cane fields lives one of the most deadly. But why do snakes need venom? This inland taipan is hunting rats. The cane fields are alive with them. But they are dangerous prey. Rats can bite back. A snake's head houses all its sensory equipment, eyes, taste, smell, brain, and the head is vulnerable. It bites and retreats immediately. The head is undamaged and the venom is doing its work. The rat is now paralysed. The snake can safely approach its prey. Venom gives the snake two huge advantages. It not only kills the prey, but by the time the snake begins to swallow the rat, the venom has already begun to digest it, breaking down cells in the body. The venom in a baby snake can be even more powerful than the adults. This young cantle viper 
is luring prey with its worm-like tail. The frog is deceived by the enticing movements. Unaware of its lucky escape, the frog remains convinced there is a worm there. Amazingly, the frog seems unable to see the snake. The venom acts quickly, subduing the frog. The young viper catches mainly amphibians, but as it grows older, the chemistry of its venom will change to suit other prey. Donald Striden works with South African snakes to understand how venoms affect the bodies of prey animals and how the venom is delivered during a bite. The snake that I've chosen here is a puff adder, and they've got the very long front hinge fangs with a cytotoxin, a cell destroying venom. I'm going to very carefully open up the snake's mouth and show you this mechanism. The snake doesn't like its mouth to be open. It's much like you going to the dentist and having your mouth prodded into. Now the fangs lie against the palate of the mouth. So if I just open there, you can hardly see the fangs. But if I now slip my stick just behind the fangs and get them forwards, you can very clearly see how they hinge. Now the fangs are covered by skin sheath here. I'm going to try and slip this sheath up so that one can see the naked fang. And there we have one fang nicely exposed. These fangs are hollow. They work like little hypodermic needles, so they inject venom through the fang into its victim. And in fact, you can see a tiny droplet of venom on, on the one fang there. You know, the venom glands of a snake are very similar to the saliva glands in a human, in that if uh, we have a dry mouth, our body very easily reproduces uh, saliva. And the mechanism with a snake is almost exactly the same, in that venom is never easily exhausted under normal conditions, the snake is never without its venom. A gaboon viper produces venom in huge amounts. It's a large, fat-bodied snake and needs to have a lot of venom to subdue large prey quickly. The viper is too slow to chase its victim. To inject such large quantities, the gaboon viper has the longest fangs in the world. Each is almost as long as a human thumb. That's quite a bite. But on us, even a smaller bite is no fun. What's happening to this man is what happens in a rat. The venom is breaking down the cells inside the punctured leg. He's not feeling too bad, but measurements show his leg is swelling fast, a sign that the snake injected a potentially fatal hit of venom. Blood vessels are rupturing. Fluid is accumulating as tissues break down. Only the correct antivenom can stop the process before vital organs are damaged. Antivenom is a specially prepared fluid, a serum containing antibodies, proteins that will neutralize the venom in the snake bite. The patient has survived the night, but the tissue damage continues for a while. There is still venom present. Although snakes are not trying to kill us, it's worth knowing how some of them bite. The next snake that I have here, it's uh, Africa's most venomous snake. And this is a worm slung. It has drop for drop the strongest venom of any snake in Africa, more so than a black mamba or any of the cobras. Most people think that a back fang snake can't bite uh, onto a large part of your body. Most people think that the, the worm slung can only latch onto your earlobe or small finger. But as you can see here, this is not true, in that the whole head of the snake is divided in half by its mouth. And they can open that mouth up to about 120 degrees. And with the mouth that wide open, 
They could very easily bite you on the flat of your hand or the top of your leg, wherever it pleases. If you were bitten by the snake, you would literally bleed to death. So what's going to happen to you is that you're going to bleed into your heart, into your stomach, into your bowels. You're going to be urinating blood, defecating blood, and it's really a horrific way to die. But nobody's told this frog. This vine snake in Central America is also backfanged, just like the boom slang. But fortunately, in small prey, death comes quickly. The venom of some snakes with fixed fangs attacks the nerves. Now, the front uh, fixed fang snake that I've chosen is a snouted cobra here. These fangs are much smaller than the front hinged fangs of an adder. Those fangs don't have to fold backwards. You see, they remain erect in the mouth. So the snake merely has to snarl its mouth and so inject its venom. And sometimes a mere scratch is enough to kill you. The neurotoxins would interfere with the neural communication system of our body and paralyze uh, the vital organs, so the heart or the diaphragm muscle, and one would die from asphyxiation. You literally cannot breathe and possibly die of heart attack. In most countries where people face a daily risk of encountering snakes, wood piles and exposed rubbish heaps are surprisingly common. Yet all can encourage snake trouble. Wood piles provide shelter for snakes and rubbish attracts rats. What better prey is there here in Africa for a black mamba? Two meters of powerful hunter. It haunts the outbuildings and can strike like lightning with a quick working venom. To a black mamba, this South African bungalow is just another outbuilding, a cave in which food may be in good supply. Tony Morgan confronted an uninvited guest, and it bit him. This is a typical uh, corner that snakes like to hide in, and it was a similar corner like this near my front door on the farm that I found a mamba all curled up here with my fishing rods and various things like that. And as I don't kill anything, particularly snakes, I grabbed this uh, particular implement and I thought that I, I hooked him out and I thought that I'd pinned him down. Unfortunately, he, he was able to stretch quite a bit and he got me uh, just below the knee with one fang. I then lasted exactly 30 minutes. And my wife uh, got me down to Donald's place very quick and then he took over and drove me down to the hospital where we were fortunate in finding a doctor on duty. And 30 minutes after the bite, I said to him, I cannot exhale anymore. And he said at the same time, which I didn't hear, um, his heart has stopped as well. So in effect, I was dead at that time. Bill Hast in Florida is the kind of person to whom Tony Morgan owes his life. But collecting venom to make anti-venom has almost cost Bill his own life. I was bitten by a cobra and ended up in a respirator. I had stopped breathing. <clears throat> I was bitten by a mamba in the leg, a king cobra bite in the knee. Well, my blood pressure went to zero. But the most recent one, which was a cane break rattlesnake <clears throat> a couple of months ago, I got bitten on the back of the hand. That was almost pure carelessness. Bill, who's nearly 90, milks venom into a collecting vessel while he gently squeezes the venom glands. But how has he survived 168 bites? The answer may be quite natural. The South African Cape Cobra, a highly venomous snake, is prey to meerkats. But why are meerkats apparently unaffected by frequent cobra bites? They seem to be immune.
perhaps the frequency of such bites is a clue to Bill's survival. Back in 1948, September the 18th to be exact, I started immunizing myself with venom from the Cape Cobra of South Africa. I diluted the venom 10,000 times and took one hundredth of a milliliter. Then I graduated or increased the dose over months and then eventually years, added different species <clears throat> until now on Usually, once a week, I take a booster, and it's a mixture of 32 different species. So <clears throat> I know that got me through a lot of these bites, at least over the threshold, if not in most cases, uh, saved my life. Snakes and humans share the world uneasily. This spectacled cobra is common in the paddy fields of India. Every year, more than 10,000 people are killed here by snake bite. Antivenom is unavailable. For the same reason, snake bite is a major killer across Central and South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. It's hard to arrive at an exact number, but at the lowest estimate, 50,000 people die each year. In South Africa, Donald Stridham is answering an emergency call. In this part of South Africa, we have a lot of venomous snakes. People are active in the field here. They often come across snakes, they find them in their houses, and that's when uh, we are called out. Seems to be the place over here. Lots of people standing around there. A snake in a house is a cause for local excitement. But the occupants have already done the right emergency drills. All people have left the house, and they've not only closed the door, but sealed it as well with a towel. Donald can be fairly sure the snake is still inside. What I'm going to do here is um, have to put a visor on because in a situation like this, it's very possibly a spitting snake. So um, I'm just gonna get a few things that I need here. Yeah, there's really a lot of hiding places here. The snake could be anywhere. Um, this is really, yeah, it's a bit dark in here as well, so one's gonna be really careful. But just take care where you, where you walk over there. Um, you take it easy. There, there are places around you where it could easily just spring out on you. So if you guys just stay back a bit there. Um, I'm going to have a look in these dark areas. I need to stay in the open area of the floor because I suspect it to be behind things around like this here. Oh, that's clear. Um, You know, we could so easily find a mumba in a place like this. And these things are like coiled springs. I mean, once it feels that it's not hidden anymore, it could just come flying out. You see, these are perfect. You'd find rodents here as well. And this is what the snake is probably looking for, or to just try to hide from the disturbances outside, possibly. You know, this whole area is really, really good. Look at these mats under here. No, nothing there. Um, you know, they, they, I don't know. Sometimes they even find an escape. They could actually maybe even get out from where um, the, the door, door was plugged out there. It could have pushed past there. But um, I think we just maybe should carry on looking. You know, it could also have climbed. I mean, these walls are pretty rough up here. I could take a, a look somewhere up here. Nothing there. Oh, yeah. Oops, maybe something up there. 
There's something in the corner over there. Um, yeah. Okay, without a doubt, that's a mamba. It's a black mamba. Um, there's a piece of coil just around the, between the roof and the, and the uh, wall there. We know that mambas are very, very poisonous. I mean, if this bites us, we're quite far from a, a hospital now. So we've got to be really, really careful. And if you can just stay in the furthest uh, corner away from me there, just out of my way, I'm going to bring it down and just get it straight past you outside and then deal with it, get it into the bag. Trying to edge away from me there. Let's head out again. <laughs> yep. It's opening up its black mouth at me, it's warning me. You know, it's interesting that the snake doesn't just come out attacking, but at this stage, having it like this obviously feels threatened. At this stage, it'll bite whatever comes near to its mouth. And that's, oh, it's a big snake, it's bigger than I thought. It's a long animal. Just watch it behind me there. Please don't just come any closer than that. You know, the snake's obviously hyped up now, and whatever touches it through the bag, it's going to bite. And you can see through the bag here. I'm going to just pin it down to the side, make sure that it's safe in one area, and then I'm going to release the head. Just take care, they don't come too close. Now, you just touch that bag and this thing bites. I'm going to find a safe place to uh, release it. Let's get it in there. And I think I should go and reassure the lady here that her house is clear of snakes and uh, that it's safe to go back in again. Housewives in India are also troubled by snakes. The men of this village, called Vindravan, have also made a profession out of removing them. But he's not going to let this cobra go free. For hundreds of years, this has been a village of snake charmers. The snake is captivated by the swaying pipe, following every rocking movement. And that's the snake charmer's secret. The music plays no part. It's probably too high a frequency for the snake to appreciate. It has no eardrums. Sound vibrations are perceived only by way of the skin, muscle and bone. Getting bitten is a routine hazard for charmers. But they have a special snake stone, which they believe can magically draw venom from the wound. In truth, Survival is most likely to depend on the snake only biting in defense, using little or no venom. Also, the victim himself may have received many mild bites in his lifetime and developed some immunity. But the piece of soapstone is the treatment they believe in. And the special stone is very expensive, so it must work, mustn't it? This baby cobra in Africa is a kind that no snake charmer would ever use. It threatens the civet cat by standing tall, looking big, but it has another weapon. This is a spitting cobra, and it sprays venom, which irritates the eyes of the attacker.
It's not lethal, but it works. <coughs> South America, the Llanos of Venezuela, the wetland home of a much bigger baby, the largest snake in the world, the anaconda. This giant has no venom at all. To capture prey, it relies on muscle power, coiling round its victim and squeezing the breath out of it. And a large snake needs large prey. The biggest rodent in the world fits the role. A capybara the size of a pig is fairly easy to ambush as it bathes in the warm waters. snake must have teeth strong enough to hold on to such lively prey and be ready to loop its body tightly round the capybara to avoid being bitten or scratched. The anaconda moves in, the most powerful of constrictors. Look out, Jimmy! Hold that head, hold it! Mike hears Jimmy's cries for help. Jim is black in the face, almost done for. To be safe, the actor needed to know exactly how a large constrictor kills, just as Donald Stridham does. I caught the snake on somebody's farm. It had eaten something really large, and uh, the farmer was worried it's going to eat his dogs or even maybe his children, which isn't uh, totally unrealistic. Have a look at that. Yeah, it's getting me around the arm here. I can really feel it. You get this area here, I mean, you can see how it's stopping the blood supply there. And uh, this is my arm, so I mean, I can handle it. I can, I can wrap it off me here. But can you imagine that around somebody's neck? Um, that, I mean, that's pretty, pretty tight over here. This movie that we watched, we've just seen it with this Jimmy where it had wrapped around him. Um, it wasn't totally wrapped around his neck, not like the way this has got me around the arm here. With uh, Jimmy, I could literally see that he turned around to get this python around his body, and it wasn't a natural constricting pose. Whereas this snake has got me. I mean, look at that. My arm's going quite red there. You know, if you try and make a plan here, yeah, really got me. One thing I got right in the uh, movie was that uh, the python, like many other non-venomous snakes, are ambush, ambush animals. They will lie in ambush for their prey. It'll lie there, wait for the animal to come past, strike at it, bite it, and hook it with those hundred needle-sharp teeth. It then throws coils around this animal while it pulls the animal into the coils. It then asphyxiates the animal. Every time it breathes out, it tightens more and more, and the animal dies of suffocation. If one looks into the mouth of this python, you can see a little circular tube, and that is the extension of its epiglottis. And it's very useful for a snake to have this, because what happens is, when it swallows, that'll extend right out of the mouth, and so it can still breathe while it's got a full mouth of uh, antelope. I think uh, the snake uh, deserves to be released now, so not to stress it uh, too much, I'm going to release it here in the bush. And this looks ideal here. And as soon as I let the head go, that's it, I can feel. I can feel the coils have immediately relaxed on me there. And the snake just wants to get away. Straight into the bush there. Wow, look at that arm. This arm's gone really quite red there. What a relief to have that off. This is great. I love letting snakes go back into the bush. It's such a nice feeling. You can do something for them as well. It's a nice feeling for me and hope you for the snake. Back in Anaconda country, there's someone who's trying to do good things for that largest of snakes. Anacondas have killed and eaten people, but that fact does not deter Maria Munoz. At the ranch of El Cedral, the petite Maria is on the track of her favourite animal.
She works with an assistant, Ramon. A snake longer than three meters always requires two people for safe handling. It's the breeding season for anacondas, and Maria recognizes this group of snakes to be small male anacondas. They, she hopes, will lead her to the much larger female somewhere nearby. The males are bagged up to keep them out of the way. The female they find is four meters long. Maria uses a trick to calm it down. She dips its head in the mud so it can't see. For several years, Maria has been studying how anaconda populations here live and vary. The tail, I would like to know is new one or she has a mark. Let me see the clock. Good, it's a new female for us. That's mean there are more than 900 anacondas, green anaconda in this ranch. Before Maria began her work, no one knew how many anacondas could live here. Now, by taking blood samples for DNA, she is also getting some idea about how they are related. But of course, she still needs to know how long these giants are. Six meters is her personal best, about three meters short of the world anaconda record. These are the heaviest snakes in the world, but this one is a little lighter than the 220 kilo monster in the record books. 44.45 kilogram. Some snakes, like this South African tiger snake, not only constrict their prey, but are also venomous. I've got the tiger snake's favorite prey. It is a striped skink. Now I'm going to bring it in closer and you're going to notice that the tiger snake will bite and poison its prey, also wrap around it to constrict and kill. Now this is of course a dead skink, so I'm going to move it around so that the snake thinks that it's alive. The tiger snake's venom is weak. So it needs to grip the lizard firmly, not only to prevent escape, but to limit the risk of damage to itself during a struggle. Even more remarkable is an African egg-eating snake's ability to get its mouth round an egg. All snakes can eat meals bigger than their heads. They simply open very wide, and then ligaments allow the lower jaw to expand. Surprisingly, the egg cannot be crushed till it reaches special bones in the spine which can pierce the shell. For convenience, a snake does better to eat another snake. A king cobra is called king because it is a snake eater. The mangrove snake it's attacking is only mildly venomous. No match for the king. Exactly how long this meal is, is not easy for the king cobra to judge. But being the largest venomous snake in the world, the chances are the victim's tail will be easily reached and swallowed. So how does a snake avoid this fate? One way is to play dead. This eastern hognose snake is giving his best performance. Its play acting must convince a threatening indigo snake. 
there's an interesting moment of standoff. But the actor has a further defensive card to play. A gland in its tail emits a smell of death to go with the gaping mouth. It's the performance of a lifetime. And the enemy is fooled. A snake that looks dangerous can keep predators away. Red next to yellow will kill a fella is a useful rhyme about a coral snake. It is venomous. Red next to black is a friend of Jack is true for a milk snake. It mimics warning colours and only pretends to be dangerous. A pretend head keeps the real head of a calibre ground python safe. The real head has a tongue that gives it away. But the deception can be good enough to cause a predator to attack the tail by mistake. And a tail is not a vital organ. Often, the brilliant colours and patterns of a snake's skin are not a warning, but a subtle camouflage, matching its surroundings. And to us, they can look beautiful. Scales come in endless varieties of shape and structure. In the wild, snakes are not easily seen a quality which suits these masters of ambush perfectly. But the beauty and subtlety of snakeskin has also been their undoing for thousands of years. Fire is traditionally used by hunters in Cameroon to expose the hiding places of aggressive rock pythons. Entering an aardvark burrow to retrieve so vicious a snake is a risk few men will undertake. Once this nightmare task was a test of virility, a rite of passage from boyhood to man. Only by using toes and fingers can the hunter move, and ahead is an angry python. His companions keep track of his progress. They may have to rescue him. The heat is stifling. The hunter must squirm back through dust and biting ants, dragging nearly 50 kilos of python. His companions take over. These are the last of the python hunters left in Cameroon. Firearms have made it easier to kill other animals for food and skins. But the meat on this snake in former times would have been essential, and its skin a profitable result from such horrific effort. As any snake grows, it must shed its outer skin like an overtight suit. The new scales revealed are at their best. The cast-off skin is discarded, and with it also go most of the parasites that have attached to the snake. Shedding dead skin regularly has special significance for the rattlesnakes. Each time a rattlesnake slips out of its old skin, its rattle gains another section at the base. The rattle is a series of loose-fitting interlocking scales that, when shaken, produce a sound that warns large animals not to step on the snake. Although only a warning, the rattle has been the rattler's downfall. Seen only as a venomous nuisance and because they are so easy to locate, 
Tens of thousands are killed each year. I hate rattlesnakes. JP Jones sees rattlesnakes only as potential killers of people and livestock. He's hunted them man and boy. But recently, he's finding it harder to find them. He simply can't hear them. Even with the listening apparatus he designed himself. There are rattlers around, but many are becoming quieter. Ruthless hunting is exterminating the loudest. A greater proportion of snakes with weak rattles are living and breeding. Not having a loud warning, of course, makes a snake even more dangerous. But JP is undaunted and his roundup goes on, presumably until only silent rattlesnakes survive in his part of Alabama. Getting rid of snakes anywhere is never the good idea it might seem. Farmers in Vietnam didn't value the many snakes that once lived in the paddy fields until they vanished. The snakes were trapped for food and the rice crop was attacked by rats. A third of the country's crops were devastated by the rodents. Only the return of natural predators, such as pythons, could save the farmers' livelihoods. The government's official snake repatriator is Dr Nagoyan. He's bringing snakes to the village where he was born. And he knows how important it is that the children, as well as the farmers, should realise how essential these harmless snakes are to their future. Each python released can potentially eat about 100 rats a year. Dr Nagoyan will release 20, among them females that could each have 20 to 80 baby pythons a year. In the battle against rats, each snake in a paddy field is worth far more than all those sold to be eaten. The snakes in our world can be partners in our survival, and we know a great deal about them. Or do we? Well, sometimes when the uh, snake shed, it's not a complete shed, and uh, we have to help it. And in this case, the uh, top scale wasn't quite off, and I think I can get it. And now he's all done. A snake with two heads. And such creatures are not uncommon. Something went wrong in the egg. Only one head can feed, but this ring-necked snake will survive happily. It's very interesting how attached people get or not get to their reptilian pets. Most people think that how can you get attached to a snake or a lizard as compared to a fluffy kitten or a cat or dog. But in a way, you really do get attached to these animals, partly because you soon realize how individual they are and how the personalities differ. By and large, you do get very attached to your animals. I'm constantly surprised by snakes. They're fascinating animals. Just everything about them is so different to us. They smell using their tongues. They move without any legs. They're cold-blooded. They have no ears. And they're just so interesting. They're so different. and so much to learn about them. Handling snakes with skill and care and learning more about them, most of us may prefer to leave to the experts. But snakes are always going to be with us as part of the natural balance of things. And if we can look for a moment with a different eye, their beauty will also be revealed. <laughs>